It's a good reading, isn't it? And, and the, after lunch, there's even a better one. R rated. We people in Austral End are a very small part of the human race. And our lifespan is but a blink in the history of this earth. We're only on it for a very short time. Those of you who are young who think 80 years old, it goes so quickly, so quickly, ask Tanda Ali. Our existence, historically and geographically, is so minute compared to God's. Our perspective is very limited Even when you know a bit of history, you know so little. He knows the end from the beginning. To him, all the nations of the earth are but dust on the scales, which doesn't affect the scales at all. All the nations of the earth are like dust on scales, like a drop in the bucket And when God looks down from heaven to this earth, he sees all in one go. Now, you and I can't do that, but God is God, and he can. But on what is God focused when he looks down at this earth? What grabs the attention of the ruler of the kings of the earth? Is he eyeing the nations, the governments of the world? Is he looking at the politicians? Or is he looking at big business? Maybe educators, guiding children, scientists, scientific discoveries. In the opening of the seventh seal, yes, it has happened at last. You'll notice that chapter uh, 7 is a separate. The sixth seal is the end of chapter 6, but the seventh doesn't open until chapter (coughs) 8. It's happened at last. We see the throne's interest in the church, especially via the prayers of all the saints. You mentioned that there, and if you've got your Bibles there, keep keep them open, you can follow these sermons through. They rise like the smoke of burning incense, sweet to the senses and pleasing to God. In the fifth seal, back in chapter 6, we saw that those already in heaven who had died for the testimony of Jesus and offered their prayers to the Almighty, that those who had killed them might be judged righteously, We saw that God said to them, yes, I'm going to answer your prayers, but not in your time, in my time. And that's how God does things, doesn't he? We don't control God at all. They had to wait until the full number of martyrs was completed. And there are still martyrs every day of the week. Every day of the week, people dying for Jesus in one country or another. So this morning, in our exposition of chapter 8, we shall see what God thinks of the prayers that the church, that's you and me, offer up through his son Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name in heaven and on earth. The sixth seal, we read it, Zinette read it, ended with the day of judgment about to fall. And chapter 7 began with it about to happen. The wicked were crying out in terror for the rocks to hide them from the wrath of him who sits on the throne and the Lamb, Jesus. But then we learned that all of the servants of our God had to be sealed first before that cataclysmic event could occur. And so we are now in that period of time when people, Christians, people being called out of every nation and tribe and language and sealed with the blood of Jesus. And they are an innumerable number, symbolized in chapter 
seven by 144,000. But then John and the Church of the Gospel era, that's us, is given a glimpse, an encouraging view of the church's future. Gathered around the throne of God and the Lamb, giving tumultuous eternal worship for their salvation. They're being washed in the blood of the Lamb. And that chapter concluded with the greatest tenderness and love from the Father, where God himself wipes away every tear from the eyes of those who had endured suffering for the sake of Jesus. And now, now the seventh seal is opened. But it is preceded by a silence in heaven of about half an hour. It's a symbolic, relatively short time compared to other times in Revelation, symbolizing a solemn time a time for waiting and reflection because something enormous is about to happen. Perhaps we should pause now for 30 minutes of silence. That would be hard, wouldn't it? But there was silence. Imagine being silent for 30 minutes. You can practice that with your spouse at home today. All heaven's creatures are speechless in awe and wonder at the beginning of the execution of God's judgments on the earth. It's an awesome time. The silence intensifies the solemnity of what is about to occur. And at its solemn conclusion, we note that the seventh seal is but a prelude to the sounding of seven trumpets but seven trumpets of divine judgment on the earth. But before they are commanded to blast forth, John and we are given an insight into what has occasioned them. What occasioned these trumpets to blow? In this short interlude, we read amazing words. We read that after the ascension and reception of the prayers of the saints, God responds to the prayers by answering them. It is then that the censer, the same symbolic censer that originally carried the incense and the prayers to the throne room, is emptied of all those prayers, indicating that they have been received, and now it is refilled with fire from the altar which is then hurled onto the earth the result of which was thunder rumblings lightning and an earthquake each of those putting fear into the heart of man we see it on tv don't we and those words those four words are used regularly through the book of revelation to indicate judgment of God and the wrath of God being poured out on mankind. But did you pick it up? What was it that triggered God's judgments and the coming seven trumpets of judgment? It was the prayers of the saints. How can that be, you say? You and I are only too aware of the weakness of our prayers, the shortness of our prayers, the self-centeredness of our prayers, let alone the imperfection of our prayers, the irregularity of our prayers, the sinfulness of our prayers, and thus the ineffectiveness of our prayers. Don't you and I sometimes wonder if our prayers ever get above the ceiling? let alone into the throne room of heaven? Is our Heavenly Father really listening to my prayers? Well, all this is true about our prayers. You know that and I know that. But it is not the whole story. God's Word teaches us that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and the Holy Spirit 
are our heavenly intercessors who sanctify, purify, and perfect our prayers so that when they finally reach the throne room, they are God-glorifying and effective prayers that reflect the glory of God and the will of God. Says Paul in Romans, we do not know what to pray for. Now yeah, he confesses that. We do not know what to pray for. I'm reading from Scripture. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. The Holy Spirit groans when you and I pray. He perfects our prayers as our intercessor. Be thankful for the Son and the Spirit. And in answer to these perfect prayers, Almighty God responds with immediate and severe judgments on the earth. And congregation, this has been the way he has always been responding through the ages, through the ages. When men sin against him, when men persecute the church, these people, he will respond in judgments. Consider Psalm 9, which I read this morning. It's an amazing psalm, almost a book of Revelation. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy, for you have uprooted their cities. Powerful words. So what grace we receive from our Heavenly Father to perfect our prayers and then to respond to them. What an encouragement for us to pray continually, knowing that the Lord hears and answers our perfected prayers. Prayer is the spiritual breath of the Christian. When we commune with our Heavenly Father, offering Him the desires of our hearts with faith, honesty and humility. Here's a question for you. Do you think the Lord would like you to engage more in prayer? Personally? As a family? What about as husbands and wives? Do you pray together? As a church? Ever had a prayer meeting? I had the privilege and blessing of teaching in the Muckenbuden Christian School for 10 years. And here's a story from Muckenbuden. Did you know that the Muckenbuden Church of Christ held a prayer meeting, especially to pray for the 2007, 11, 2007 federal election? That was when Kevin Rudd won. There was a prayer meeting regularly in a special place in a special corner called Prayer Corner up the North Road. You can visit it. I had the privilege too of spending five years in Kalgoorlie doing a church plan for their churches. And did you know that a church in Kalgoorlie organises a week of prayer? A week of prayer. When Christians in all churches pray for the spiritual needs of that city. I think that's right. Nobody could say that's wrong. What about us doing something like that? Foster Lynn, Bunbury. Do you think that this congregation also needs to grow in the natural Christian activity of prayer? I know so. It would have been a great encouragement to the early church in its time of persecution and suffering to know that their prayers not only reached the throne of God, but were answered by God's actions on the earth. But now to the trumpets. We deal with four of them this morning and three after lunch. We note that there are seven, just as with the seals. This number symbolically represents a fullness 
a completeness of the activity, judgment. It will occur later with the seven bowls. It seems to be God's favourite number. But why trumpets? Well, in Scripture we find that the trumpets were instruments of warning of impending destruction. And indeed, that is just what they are in Revelation 2. Do you remember the fall of Jericho? Joshua's command was, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh and make seven priests carry trumpets in front of them. And as they marched around the city, the trumpets were continually blown. But no human voice was heard. In the book of Joel, we read, Blow the trumpets in Zion! Sound the alarm on my holy hill! Let all who live in the land tremble! For the day of Yahweh is coming. It is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness. Not very cheerful prophet, was he? The remainder of this dark, gloomy and black chapter of Revelation introduces the first four trumpets of impending doom to those who persecute the people of God whom he loves passionately. Now we know why the servants of God were sealed to be spared the anguish of these judgments. Yet what was their purpose and function? The answer is only given at the end of the seventh trumpet in chapter 9. If you've got your verse Bible there, you can check it, verse 20, 21, where we read that their purpose was to bring mankind to repentance before God, to work in humanity a recognition of God's existence and his power in the earth to humble sinners before the cross of Calvary where they would receive God's salvation, the forgiveness of all their sins. It's not that he is slow in coming to judgment, but rather that the judge is expressing his patience towards the wicked. Today we live in a world where God's People do not even believe in God's existence. So that makes it doubly hard for us to point to judgments of God on the earth and say, this is what God is doing, repent. Ha! Huh. Don't believe in God. Global warming. The first trumpet is sounded by an angel. Hail and fire mixed with blood are hurled on the earth. And a third of the earth is consumed. Is this what is going to happen literally? No. The reference to blood should indicate that they are symbolic weapons of judgment. We are to be wary to give literal interpretations in which is, in which a, is a highly symbolic book. We've already seen that this is how Revelation interprets itself. Congregations, for example, are symbolically represented by lampstands. Chapter 1. Christ is represented as a lamb, and in the next verse, a lion. And in the next chapter, a rider on a white horse. Can't be all three at once. God's being and power are represented by a throne. It's a symbolic symbol. Nowhere does the book of Revelation ask to be interpreted literally or scientifically or even rationally. It is a highly symbolic visual picture meant to convey a significant impression to a people who were largely illiterate but could understand the meaning behind pictures such as these visions. The weapons of the first trumpet are not new either. The first trumpet is founded on the historical seventh plague on Egypt. Did you notice that? 
God's judgment on Pharaoh and the people who cruelly tortured God's covenant people, Israel. All boys born had to be drowned, trying to destroy this people. But the Lord said, via Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh, by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the face of the earth. This is God speaking. I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt. Here, the historical reality of the plague is used as a symbol in the book of Revelation of future judgments. But what then is meant? Well, it points to all land disasters on the earth as being sent by God as judgment to make humanity see that there is a higher power than they to whom they need to turn before the final and great day of God's wrath comes when there will be no longer time to repent and believe final yes these disasters are a foretaste of that great day Throughout history, these disasters continue to occur, but note that only a symbolic one-third is destroyed. On the great day of judgment, the whole earth will be utterly destroyed as by fire. Did you notice during the week, uh, commentators regarding the floods in Pakistan made one-third of the country is under water. Interesting. Use that phrase, that fraction. But there's always two thirds left alive to contemplate the meaning and implication of the disaster. It's not a literal fraction, it's a symbolic fraction. Remember the Australian bushfires, the Californian bushfires of the present time, the Spanish bushfires that are still burning. In the light of the first trumpet, they are examples of God's warning trumpet. Repent! Turn from your sins to Christ. Insurance companies still call them acts of God. And the church continues to pray that there will be some who will take note of the event and believe in Christ. That's how our prayers should be. The United Nations Secretary General, speaking at the United Nations Global Summit in support of urgent climate action, went so far as to say, nature is angry. Nature is angry. Well, he got the angry right, but he failed to acknowledge the first cause. The Creator and the living God. Nearly, but not quite. So how should we Christians react to such indications of God's judgment? Well, it gives his church, that's you and me, opportunities to express Christ's love by providing necessary relief to the human suffering that eventuates, which God can use to bring sinners to repentance. For example, our regular church appeals for disasters. Remember, beginning of the year, Ukraine. Have you forgotten? Ukraine. And at the present time, I think and hope, you've got the shoebox appeal coming up. Is that right? Yeah. And Jenny Abetz, has she been down here at all? I heard her speak about the shoebox in Williton some weeks. Oh, no, it was in Gateway, sorry. I go around the churches a bit, forget which one I've been at. In Gateway, she made the comment that, yeah, these bo she has seen it with her own eyes. When kids uh, get these boxes and they open them up, in the name of Jesus, yeah, these children believe in Jesus. It's like $25 a box and you've saved a soul. 
That, that cheapens it, I know, but in, in economic terms, that's what it is. So, when, she, when you have that opportunity, give. There's your chance to save souls. The second trumpet is sounded, and a blazing mountain was thrown into the sea. Any artists in our midst? Have a go at drawing that. A blazing mountain thrown into the sea by the hand of God. And a third of the sea turned into blood, killing a third of marine life and destroying a third of ships. And remember, in those days, the Mediterranean Sea was a very uh, busy maritime highway. There were ships going upwards and forwards, backwards and everywhere. Busy place. They're still digging a few up from the ocean. And this, this trumpet is based on the first plague on Egypt, when the Nile River turned into blood. The focus is clearly on seas and oceans. Yes, it is a solemn thought that all marine disasters, oil spills, environmental disasters, ferry disasters, are God's judgment of warning the earth. But remember God's aim, to shake unbelievers into repentance so that they might know his forgiveness. The third trumpet sounds, and a great blazing star falls on one third of the rivers and springs of the earth with disastrous consequences. Obviously symbolic, as one star can't hit a third of the rivers and springs of the earth in one go. Again, there is death from floods, ensuing epidemics, water pollution. Think of the catastrophic floods regularly occurring around the world. Australia, Pakistan at the moment, Afghanistan too. And the fourth trumpet sounds, there is no let up congregation. The heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon and the stars are struck resulting in a third of light disappearing from the earth. Was that a plague on Egypt? Yes. It was the ninth plague on Egypt, wasn't it? When the land was covered in darkness, striking fear into the hearts of Egyptians, would this bring Pharaoh to repentance? Sadly, no. Darkness, the absence of light, can be viewed also as God withdrawing his common goodness from the earth. No more sunshine. No more restraining the darkness of men's evil hearts. A fearful thing. We see it with President Putin in the Ukraine. Before the remainder of the trumpets are sounded, it wasn't that they had lunch in heaven. There was a short interlude. But was not to bring relief to the wicked, but warn them that what was going to follow in the remaining three trumpets was going to be even worse than the earth had received in the first four. Woe, woe, woe. An eagle, the most feared of bird of prey, introduces the remainder with a loud cry of three woes. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded. And that's this afternoon's sermon. But now to the trumpets. Now you might have say, might have thought, where is Christ in all of this? We haven't seen him, we haven't heard of him. Isn't the scripture Christ-centered? We like to make our preaching Christ-centered, our lives Christ-centered. Where is he in all this catastrophe? Well, we need to soberly remember that it was he 
the wrathful lamb who opened the seventh seal, revealing the divine purpose of judgment aimed at repentance in all creation disasters. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth and the one to whom all authority and power is given in heaven and on earth. The trumpets continue to be warnings, merciful warnings, undeserved by humanity, who trample God's name, spit in his face, ignore his existence, and trample his people into the dirt. I heard recently of two 16-year-old boys in Vietnam converted from communism and their families disowned them, kicked them out of the house. There are people suffering for Jesus and we have such beautiful lives here in Australia. You might have thought, have any repented from these trumpets? Well, yes, there have been. Remember John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace? He was converted by the first trumpet, which fell on the oceans in the midst of a mighty storm in the Atlantic Ocean. He got down on his knees, feared that he was going to hell because he was going to drown. Converted to Jesus, became a minister of the gospel and knew what God's grace was for he had been a very sinful man, slave trader. Martin Luther converted also through a storm. Charles Colson, a prison fellowship fame, converted through Watergate. I'm not sure which trumpet that might be. It might be one of the afternoon sermon, uh, uh, trumpets. But converted in prison and left to bring the gospel to other prisoners in, in prisons throughout the world. Yes, there have been some. And uh, I heard from Ros Bergraf, who has contacts in Uganda. People in Uganda have been converted through COVID-19. Fear of falling into death and not knowing where they're going. Yes, it is certainly a solemn revelation that helps Christians to take comfort by understanding the purpose of these disasters. Yet you may have noticed an absence of references to God's people in the blowing of the trumpets. The reason for that is because they are sealed and escape the horror and death of these disasters. Escape, you say? Christians are also caught up in the earth's disasters? <coughs> that is true. But believers recognise God's providential hand in these events. We understand their purpose and we live and die in faith. Death has lost its sting. Death is going home to Jesus. No fear. As his servants, we are sealed by sovereign grace through the blood of the Lamb. We fear him who has the power to cast into hell. Man fears the one who can only kill the body. By grace, we never have to face the wrath of the one who sits on the throne or the wrath of the lamb. Can you imagine the lamb being angry? Our robes have been washed in the blood of the lamb again. At death we go home to be with the Lord around his throne. Hence there is no fear of flood, fire or famine, as there is nothing on this earth that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The sealed, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, eternally safe, safe in the arms of Jesus, and none, none can pluck them from his hand. Are we not a blessed people? Amen.
Shall we pray? Lord, these trumpets are very sobering. We recognise their existence. Our TV screens are full of them day after day. Help us, Lord, to recognise your hand in these events and in some way be able to speak to our neighbours and friends. Lord, we pray that you will use these disasters to still bring some to faith in Jesus. Lord, we lament that the majority of mankind continues on its downward path to a great day of judgment. Again, it is a sobering thought, Lord, but your word reveals it, and so we believe it. Lord, as your people who are sealed, we pray that we may live holy lives, lives that reflect the love of Jesus Christ, so that others might see us and want to know the source of our joy, our peace. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.